All right. Good morning. Um, I'm super excited to be back here. I was actually here for the very first uh, DevOps Days Columbus, so um, it's an honor to be back here on year five. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, my journey and specifically how it relates to leadership evolution and kind of what I've learned throughout my career and uh, journey through uh, DevOps and Lean. Did it change? Okay, perfect. Um, so just super quick uh, intro about me. So I've been in the technology industry for over 20 years. I started as an engineer um, in infrastructure actually, so on the ops side, and uh, navigated through um, engineering leadership and then spent about 14 years at Nordstrom, um, so long time retail. And I know there's a lot of retail here, so another exciting discovery. Um, when I left Nordstrom, I was in um, a VP role supporting our customer-facing engineering team. So basically anything that touched the customer, including the store technology, as well as the e-commerce and uh, loyalty and personalization platform. So I'm going to go a little deeper into what I learned when I was there, because I went on a pretty... Uh, a fun journey while I was at Nordstrom. And then I decided to take a role at Starbucks, which was super exciting um, to lead the retail technology team there. So basically that was global POS, so I was excited to have a global opportunity. And um, if, you're, if you drink Starbucks or use their mobile app, uh, I had a connection to that too because that's all kind of integrated into POS uh, at Starbucks. Then Almost exactly two years ago, it's my anniversary this week, um, I moved to Nike. So now I'm at Nike. I started in the digital engineering organization, very similar to the role that I had when I left Nordstrom. And recently, actually mid-June, so I guess it's not that recent anymore, I uh, took a new role where I'm leading what we call our move domain, which is supply chain, inventory, order management, logistics globally. So that's my new role at Nike, which is super exciting because, as I said, I'm very passionate about lean. And a lot of the lean concepts started in supply chain and logistics. So it's pretty fun to be in a role where I get to apply that to software. And I try really hard to be a lifelong learner. Um, so I'm going to start the story grounding in the context that I was operating under at Nordstrom for about the first nine years that I was at the organization. And this is intended to just give you some visibility to how we were operating at that time. All about cost. So traditional kind of IT organization, annual planning, project-based funding, a lot of shared services. We had a lot of dependency on um, contract and ITO vendors at the time. And, um, and we were doing like typical project release type cycle. So once a year, sometimes 18 month type releases. Um, here's what I learned though, because no matter what, it's like no matter what context you're under, you learn something. Um, so the structured methods that we were using actually were pretty successful. It's like managing budget and scope was, uh, we had a high success rate. Now the challenge was it didn't always equate to customer value. So we were delivering and had those uh, boxes checked, but it didn't really equate to customer value. Our poor production support teams um, were definitely not set up for success. So typical kind of uh, anti-pattern production support teams, development teams, operating in silos, no feedback loop from production support back into the dev uh, backlogs. Um, but when you're optimizing for cost, outsourcing actually is a pretty good model, and that tended to work for us at the time. So then we had a, I would say, uh, discovery that retail was being disrupted, which right now I say those words and it's like, duh. But at the time, and it was 2011, we were watching some of the retail companies that were not being successful and realized that we needed to disrupt ourselves. 
And so we shifted away from optimizing for cost to optimizing for speed, which was a huge change for us. At the time, um, our digital experiences, our website, we were releasing twice a year and had basically a steady state investment in the website and we had outsourced our apps. So those were all being delivered by an agency. So we decided to bring that all in-house and we 30 x the investment in those platforms. So it was a huge injection of funding into the environment. Um, we also, so here you'll see that I have agile in quotes, um, because we basically said, oh, well now we have to stop being a waterfall shop. We need to move to agile. And we did what I think a lot of organizations do. We Googled scaled agile and got safe back um, and decided that we were going to implement safe in the organization. But the thing that we did that I would, um, I guess a learning that I've taken forward is we put a bunch of leaders in a room and we modified safe to make it work for us. And then we unveiled it to the organization. We were prescribing basically how we were going to deliver. And didn't have a lot of success with that because teams in the true kind of spirit of agile needed to be self-organizing and needed to come up with their own methodology and we were being very prescriptive. So we tried that for a while and then kind of backed off of that and I'll explain that in a little bit. The other thing that I learned at that time is that we really should have applied the strangler pattern. So we had a bunch of existing capabilities that were powering our digital experiences, and we had a choice to make. We could start over, or build on top, or acquire more technologies, but essentially we decided to build on top of what we already had, and that did not really scale for us, and we ended up having to do some things over later. Um, we also did not shift to an outcome-based approach, um, which was a learning that, again, I took forward that it's so important to ground the work in outcomes. Um, and we threw people at everything. So we went on this major hiring spree and just basically just hired as many people as we could. Um, and also took existing roles, retitled them, sent them to like a two-hour training, and expected to get great outcomes. And uh, it just didn't, did not work that way. Like you can't or if you're going to take traditional roles in your environment, and so for an example, business analyst, I want you now to be a product owner or a product manager. There's so much learning that is needed to be successful, and it's super important to invest in the teams and the people. So that was a learning. So then we went all in. So basically took one of our teams and it turned out to be what we called our customer mobile team. So I mentioned that we brought the mobile apps back into the environment. Then we decided we still weren't moving fast enough. Um, and at the time, um, there was a leader in our organization, super strong engineering leader, also super strong lean leader, and he was put into the role to basically lead that team. And without taking the team through a value stream mapping exercise, he just asked a bunch of questions and essentially created the value stream for the team and elevated all of the constraints that were currently happening in our mobile app space. So our cycle time, I, and it was terrible, but we were, and we were releasing twice a year. So basically, that created a burning platform to then go after all of these things that I have in orange. So stop funding projects. Let's really fund the teams. Let's you know get to a model where we're putting the teams first, and we're not having to worry about getting an annual funding plan. Um, we moved to build. So rather than acquiring technologies, we decided we were going to invest in building the capabilities within the team. Um, I mentioned the value stream map. 
took a lot of silos out. So I mentioned before that we had like production support teams and dev teams. We also had a QA team. We had infrastructure. We brought them all together and really broke down the silos and said, we're going to have a team that is focused on outcomes. So we also shifted over to outcomes. So rather than coming in and being the iPhone app team, people came in every day and they were the uh, five-star app store rating team. And their focus every day was to take us from a two-star app to a five-star app. And so the teams got really excited about uh, owning outcomes. Um, we also elevated a lot of data, which was not happening in the organization at the time. So examples included things like our crash rate. We actually started making that transparent and visible. And our product management organization really appreciated that. It actually built trust because we were making those, uh, that data visible, and then we could prioritize work to make it better. Um, we also looked at things like how many engineers do we have on the team versus product owners? How many um, program managers are we leveraging to run this effort? And uh, that helped, too, to make sure that we were right-sizing the teams and the roles. Um, and we used, I already said the value stream mapping, but that was huge. Like we moved into a space where we were value stream mapping and using A3 problem solving. So we weren't jumping to conclusions about where the bottlenecks were. So right around the same time, I would say we're about 18 months into the journey, I started to get exposure to the DevOps community. So I started in infrastructure at Nordstrom and I still stayed pretty anchored to the infrastructure team because I just had a lot of passion and empathy for being in infrastructure roles. And at the time, they were kind of leading the way independently of the customer mobile team around infrastructure as code and really driving self-service infrastructure capabilities. And uh, one of the leaders in that organization actually introduced me to John Allspa at the time, and I was able to uh, talk to him and learn about how I might scale what we were trying to do in the customer mobile space um, throughout the organization. So this, this was also a very interesting point in our journey because, because we had chosen the mobile app team to experiment, there were a lot of skeptics in the organization around taking this broader because they basically were like, well, you used the unicorn. In, inside the enterprise, and we were like, no, no. We did so much heavy lifting to get to a good place, but there was still a lot of skepticism of if we could apply these techniques to other parts of the organization. Um, but we did, um, and we also very intentionally picked pilot teams that were in a variety of situations. So one of the teams that we actually did the value stream map with was a mainframe application. We had a lot of people say it would never work. And um, I won't go deep on that story. There's actually a talk on YouTube where I, I talk about it. Um, but there, the assumption from leadership was get off the mainframe. Like, you got to just move off the mainframe. And what we actually discovered was that was not where the problem was at all. The problem was actually in data that we were requesting from our business team that they did not have. And so they would do this back and forth handoff for sometimes weeks before they could actually deliver value. And it turned out to be a simple fix to actually make it better. So um, learned a ton. The other thing we learned, um, we needed the external help. So I mentioned John Allspa. I also at the time leaned on Gene Kim. I brought him in to talk to our leaders. Um, handed out the Phoenix Project. Did all the things that I'm sure a lot of you have done. Um, and also learn that you need senior leadership engagement. The grassroots will take you so far, but you really need senior leaders to be engaged and in actions, not just words. And so that was a big discovery for me as well, that you really need senior leaders to show up. Um, so um, one thing that I've learned over time, so three pretty big organizations all going through transformation, and everybody's different. So one thing that I think 
happens a lot is like people expect that there's like a DevOps checklist that you can just distribute to the community and everybody can just check the boxes and we'll all be DevOpsing. Um, it's really not the case. I mean, every organization is different, but I will say one anchor that I leverage in every uh, situation that I've been in is value stream mapping. Because I truly believe that until you know the flow of value through the system, it makes it really hard to apply the right capabilities in your environment. So most of you are probably like doing CI CD or you know, uh, automation of some sort. Not, that's not always the answer or the first place to start. And almost always it's starting with people, which is the other reason why I'm so passionate about lean because at the core of lean, it's about respect for people. And how do you create, um, or how do you minimize burden for the team? And that's another advantage of value stream mapping because you will see it. It is super obvious where the problems are. And then the teams see it, which is also exciting. And you get that opportunity to go focus on the things that matter. Um, and all the work needs to be visible. So this is another thing that I'm super passionate about, including leaders' work. Like we need to make our work visible because what I often find is we're a bottleneck because the team should be autonomous and they should be empowered to make their decisions locally, but sometimes they need help. And speed of decision making is super important in environments and often leaders are, um, they're, they're a bottleneck. I, I know I have been. And so I'm gonna share some things that we're doing to try to uh, at least quantify the bottleneck in the system for uh, decision making. So here's where I'm at today. So I'm a, also a big fan of first 90 days. Um, I think it's a great framework to leverage. Even like in this case, I'm, I'm at Nike, but I've taken another role. Um, and so I'm leveraging the first 90 days just to learn and listen and uh, figure out kind of where, where we need to focus as a team. Um, one other thing that I've kind of learned is it's so important to be a teacher as a leader. Um, I, I'm I, very extroverted and I can talk a lot. And, um, and I'll talk about all of these concepts quite a bit. But it doesn't land unless you're really teaching it. And so I've been trying to figure out the best way to kind of show up as a teacher instead of just showing up and talking about the concepts. And one way I feel like teaching is leading by example. So if I'm asking my team to break things down into smaller you know, increments or make their work visible or be transparent or leverage data in decision making, I should also be doing that as a leader. So again, Lean, um, I, I continue to be super focused on this and I truly believe that that is the evolution that a lot of leaders need to go through is figuring out how to lead in a lean way. Um, I'll share one story uh, because I believe in going to the work. So I spend a lot of time uh, sitting with my teams and learning and listening. And I had another leader in my journey say, well, that's micromanaging. Like you're going out and you're telling your team what to do. And I said, um, and if you're familiar with the word Gemba, it's, Gemba means go and see, not go and tell. I'm not showing up to tell them what to do. I'm showing up to learn. I really want to be curious and I also want the team to feel safe telling me what they need. And if I'm engaged with the work, then hopefully I'm creating an environment where they feel comfortable telling me the help that they need. So this is a visual of a value stream map that we did and an A3. Um, and the individual in this picture is super passionate about being the owner of the value stream map. And this is a, one of the uh, walkthroughs that we were doing where he was sharing what experiments they were gonna try with their uh, value stream to uh, reduce their cycle time, so. 
also super passionate about OKRs, and I am new to this space, and I am learning as I go, um, but we are committed to leveraging OKRs within my team, and we're actually looking at doing it across technology. Um, but essentially, how do we set some uh, outcomes for the teams and, and cascade it all the way in so we get feedback from the teams? Because if the work they're doing doesn't actually move the needle on the OKR, then we're, we either have the wrong OKR or we're not prioritizing the right work. Um, so I feel like it's a good mechanism to kind of bring teams together and then share. So I'm highly dependent on a lot of different teams in our organization. So how could we share OKRs to make sure we're staying aligned on the work we're doing? And then that's a screenshot of the JIRA board that we're using with my leadership team. So we do a daily stand-up, and we're trying to make our work visible so that we're practicing what we're asking our teams to do. And the one thing that we're trying really hard to do is the only thing that should be in progress is what you're doing that day. So really trying to break the work down into something meaningful and actionable. So it's a journey. Um, and then here are some, here's how we're leveraging data. So I mentioned um, being capacity-based. So we have all the work visible so that we can see which teams are over capacity or under capacity. Do we need to make prioritization adjustments based on the work? Because often what we find is there's a lot of invisible work in our jobs. And sometimes it can be hard to uh, manage expectations, especially with product management, if they're super focused on prioritizing features. And we know that our teams do more than that. Um, we work on compliance activities. We work on um, reducing technical debt. We work on things that are actually features of the product, but they're not always talked about that way. So this is a great way for us to make it visible. We're also using the data that's part of State of DevOps report and Accelerate. So you see there's a screenshot of employee net promoter score. So we track that and use it to understand teams and where they need help. And so if we have a team with a low EN, ENPS, I'll go and visit and try to find out why they're um, feeling that way. So learn a ton through that. And we celebrate. So this is a photo of, um, we give out an orange box award every month. So if you buy Nikes, you probably get an orange box. Um, so we just, we reuse those and we stuff it full of random things that are orange. So like Cheetos and Fanta and I always joke when I take it to the teams, I'm like, there's a puppy in there. Um, but there's not a puppy in there. It's always, <laughs> it's typically like um, just random orange stuff. And uh, we ground it in, and I'll show on the next slide, we have Maxims at Nike and this one, they won for creating the future of sport. These are the other maxims. So these are leadership commitments that I make to my team and to the broader organization. I've been building these throughout my career. Um, and I'm trying to kind of map them into the maxims to see if they can show up that way. But I'll just touch on a couple. So I believe in creating a dynamic learning organization. I think it's super important. I think that um, one thing I did not say earlier, but vocabulary matters. And one thing that I think is important, we talk about failing fast, and I'm sure that gets mentioned in a lot of organizations. I actually shifted it to learn fast. Because what I found is failure often just like gives people this anxiety, and it's not necessary. And if it's really, and really, in most cases, it is about learning. Um, which is also tightly connected to under do the right thing, that first line, honoring and extracting reality. So I used to say honor reality. I always want to honor reality. I also always want reality. I don't want to walk around without the knowledge of what's really happening with my teams. I added extract because I often found, especially if you're in senior leadership, the whole dynamic of the conversation changes when you show up. And I don't want people to be scared of me. <laughs> I, I really, I'm mostly smiley, um, but I still find that I show up and like people just aren't really saying, 
what I think they want to say. And so I've been trying really hard to turn that, kind of turn that around and, and ask a lot of questions. I never ask who, by the way, like if we have an issue, who is not what I ask. It's always about what in the system broke down or how can I help? Is there something I can do to actually contribute and help? And so uh, this is something that probably is the biggest focus for me is how do I create that environment for my team and hopefully for even the broader organization. So key takeaways, um, and I said this earlier, every organization is different. Frankly, every team is different because one thing that I found is people often want to say like, let's aggregate cycle time and let's l compare teams to each other. And it's like, no, that is not the value of the data. The data is valuable to the team and you need the context in order to actually leverage the data and you can't just pick one metric. You've got to have a combination of metrics so that you can see the holistic picture. Um, but every organization is different, every team is different. And again, the only thing that I would stand behind is the value of value stream mapping regardless of the situation. Um, I talked about lean and continuous learning are critical, and I truly believe leaders have to evolve. I think the, the traditional management style of command and control is just, it does not work in, in situations where you're trying to transform your organization. And so having that uh, leadership evolution is super important. Here are some resources that I've used throughout my journey, and so I just I keep adding to this over time. Um, I mentioned the State of DevOps Report and Accelerate. Those documents that are kind of in the center, those are um, part of what's called the DevOps Enterprise Forum. They're free. They are amazing resources. Like uh, you can download them. There are things from like how to lead change to how to work with your security and audit department when you're moving to a DevOps model, there's just a ton of amazing material that you can uh, leverage. And then just some additional links to, I talked about OKRs. Um, and then if, if you want to uh, learn more about kind of my uh, philosophies on leadership, I also did a course for UC Davis on Coursera where I go deeper into some of these uh, concepts. Uh, and then you can also, if you want, search YouTube. There's a lot of DevOps Enterprise Summit talks. Um, tons of great talks from other retailers, financial services, like tons of industries that are going through this. Um, and one thing that I also believe about this community is that it's about sharing and learning from each other. I've learned so much from this community and just highly recommend like checking out any of that content. And obviously, all the DevOps Days videos, too, are amazing. Um, that's all. And I don't know if I stayed on time. Was I on time? You've got a couple of minutes. Oh. Uh, does anybody have any? Do you want to take questions? I can take questions. Uh, sure. Does anybody have any questions they'd like to ask? Yeah. Um, so being in retail, MPS is a big market. I'd never heard of an EMPS. Can yeah. you talk a little about that, how you capture that? Absolutely. And then you spoke about what you do with it, but just how you capture it. Yeah, yeah. So very similar to how NPS is captured. So we asked two questions. I actually leveraged the questions that are in the Accelerate book. So we say, we ask, how likely are you to refer a friend or colleague to your team? And then how likely are you to refer a friend or colleague to the technology organization. And then, you know, literally it's the scale of negative 100 to 100. And we try to, well, we try to get up, I think the, the guidance is like 30 and higher is, is considered good. And so when we look at that, so I have monthly reviews, even though we ask it quarterly, because there's so many teams taking the survey that it's hard to visit all of them. And so we take one a month that's a high score and a low score, and then we go seek to understand. Regardless of, even if it was, I would refer him to my team, but not to technology, I still want to go find out. But the, that's how we get the data. Yeah. 
So I have a question about, uh, you mentioned in 2011 at Nordstrom, uh, you started that process and had some false starts and things didn't go perfectly well at, at the start. How long did that entire process to transform actually take from when you decided in 2011 to when you really felt like, hey, we're doing it? That's a really great question. So, um, so the customer mobile team got there in about two years. The rest of the organization, it was closer to four. And that still was only being practiced in a subset of the organization. We had not taken it broader. And some of the reasons for that, um, which this probably won't be surprising, some teams weren't ready. And it was so important to make sure that the leaders were ready before we took the concepts to a team because we found through experimentation that the teams that sustained it, one of the keys to success was leadership engagement. And so, so there were still pockets of the organization going through that journey when I left. Yeah. Good? Awesome. We're okay. Good. Thank you Thanks. very much, Courtney. Thank you.